Hello everyone and welcome to this short video on the biological approach in psychology. Now as the name suggests, the biological approach focuses very much on the impact of biology on our behaviour and assumes that all human behaviour has a biological origin. Now because all behaviour has a biological origin, the approach also assumes that it's important to understand all internal biological structures and processes in order to fully understand human behavior. And because of that, the biological approach focuses its research very much on things like the influence of genes, the influence of the nervous system, of neurochemistry, and also of evolution as well. And they're the things that we're going to have a little bit of a look at um, throughout this video. So we'll start off with some genes. Um, so genes are passed on from one generation to the next, okay? And when they're passed on, um, they take with it information in the form of DNA, which carries instructions for certain characteristics. Now, whether those characteristics are physical or whether they're to do with your personality or to do with your behavior, it doesn't really matter. They all get carried in the form of DNA. Now, there are two kind of key phrases that you need to know for the A-level psychology spec, and that is the difference between genotype and phenotype. So your genotype is your genetic makeup, which is fixed from birth. Your phenotype, however, is how that gene is expressed in observable characteristics. And very importantly, you've got this idea that phenotype is influenced by both your genetic inheritance and also the interaction of that gene with the environment. So if you take, for example, two identical twins, they've both got the identical genes. However, one of those twins is seven foot tall and the other one is only five foot tall. So the biological approach would therefore argue that the twin that is seven foot tall has the exact same genes as the one that is five foot tall. But the only difference is, is that the gene that allows him to be seven foot tall has actually been allowed to express itself properly because of the environment that that twin has grown up in. So you could argue that the five foot tall twin has got the gene to be potentially seven foot tall. However, somewhere in his life perhaps hasn't had the right kind of nourishment, stimulation, minerals, vitamins, whatever, um, given to him and so hasn't actually been able to reach his full potential in terms of height whereas the seven foot tall twin has had all of those things and so has been able to reach um, his full potential in terms of height okay so you've got a very important distinction there between genotype and phenotype and importantly to remember that phenotype is influenced by your environment Okay, it's important to remember for exams as well because it is quite a popular question in the biological approach. You know, what is the difference between genotype and phenotype? Um, refer to the application and say, right, where is the phenotype and where is the uh, where is the genotype? Explain why twin A is like this, but twin B is like this. That kind of stuff. Okay, so it's important to know what the difference is between the two and actually what they are as well. Now, when it comes to actually conducting research um, on the influence of genes. Biological psychologists very very often use twins because twins share either 100% of their DNA or share 50% of their DNA. Okay, and actually a lot of research that has come out of twin studies has suggested that behavioral and or you know psychological characteristics can be inherited. Now the way that they usually do it is they usually compare what's known as a concordance rate of a monozygotic twins, which identical twins. Um, and concordance rates of dizygotic twins, which are non-identical twins. A concordance rate is a degree of similarity. So they're comparing how similar two identical twins are in terms of a particular trait, and then comparing that to how similar two non-identical twins are in terms of a particular trait. And then the idea is if the identical twins have a higher degree of concordance or have a higher concordance rate than the non-identical twins, then there's probably some kind of genetic element to whatever it is that they're studying. For example, research has shown that identical twins have an increased concordance rate of developing schizophrenia. So if one twin has it, 
and that person has an identical twin, then there's an increased likelihood that the identical twin will get it as well. Research has also shown that if one identical twin has got depression, then there's a 46% chance that the other twin will also develop depression or even have depression as well. Okay, so there's a 46% chance. So there is a certain degree of genetics involved in things like that, according to the research. Now, you might argue 46% isn't that big, which means there is enough room for the environment to play a role as well. But the biological approach will take away from that, that if the identical twins have a higher concordance rate than the non-identical twins, then that's proof of a genetic element to it. How big that genetic element is remains to be seen. So that's how they use research to determine whether or not there is a genetic component to illnesses like schizophrenia and depression. Okay, and sticking with the idea of genes, we're now going to have a little bit of a look at the influence of evolution. Because actually genes are the mechanisms through which evolution takes place because, you know, genes get passed on um, from one generation to the next and, you know, they take with it the desirable characteristics that are going to enhance your chances of survival, which is, you know, natural selection. Um, the idea that characteristics providing an evolutionary advantage are passed on from one generation to the next. And it's the same with psychological traits as well or psychological preferences let's say or anything really that's going to enhance a species survival so an example of that if you already uh, have done the relationships topic for example or if you know that you're going to do the relationships topic next year when you come to year two psychology this is something that you might come across research conducted in 1994 by bus into partner preference heterosexual partner preference suggests that the majority of men like the same kind of thing when they are looking for a partner and the majority of women like a thing a specific set of things when they're looking for a partner as well and the research suggests that actually men prefer females who are young who are fertile who show uh, characteristics of chastity for example Whereas women prefer traits such as having resources, being ambitious, um, being successful. Now, research into partner preference or mate preference has then led us to believe or has led biological psychologists to believe that actually we have evolved to have certain traits. So men have evolved to have certain traits, psychological traits and also physical traits that make them more attractive to females. And females have evolved certain traits, both physical and um, psychological, that make them more attractive to males as well. Okay, so that's just an example of the psychology of evolution and the influence of evolution on our behavior. So moving on, we are now gonna come to neurochemicals. For those of you who haven't yet looked at the biopsychology parts of psychology um, there is a video on that as well so feel free to have a little bit of a look at that if you want for now i'll just give you the basics and then it will kind of all become clear when you move on to the next topic biological psychologists also recognize the role of chemicals in determining behavior okay so in between two neurons you've got a gap called the synapse and at the synapse impulses are sent between neurons by chemicals called neurotransmitters now, those neurotransmitters are responsible for a whole range of things. Um, however, imbalances in those neurotransmitters are associated with atypical behavior, abnormal behavior. So, for example, having low levels of serotonin is associated with developing depression or with aggressive tendencies. Whereas having high levels of dopamine, a different neurotransmitter, is linked to positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay, so from conducting research like that, for example, into serotonin and aggression, let's say, researchers have then been able to conclude that serotonin is very important in behavior regulation and impulse control, because if you don't have enough of it, then you start to develop impulsive, aggressive behavior. And that was Crockett et al. in 2008 who found that. Okay, so that's just also a way in which biological psychologists kind of use their research into neurochemicals to help um, explain behavior. 
Okay, so that was the outline of this particular topic. We're now going to move on to some of the evaluation points. There are three evaluation points for you. I've got them fully peeled. You've got two weaknesses and one strength. Okay. Your first limitation is the fact that a lot of research is correlational and that it is very difficult to imply causation. Okay, so for example, when you're looking at schizophrenia and you're looking at biological structures involved in, in schizophrenia, research suggests that a lack of activity in a certain part of your brain is linked to the development of negative symptoms. However, the research only tells us that there's an association between the structures and the behavior. What it doesn't tell us is whether it's the structures that's causing the behavior or whether it's the behavior that's then having an effect on the structures. Okay, so there's a, there's a little bit of a correlation causation um, problem going on there. And actually, the kind of the direction of causality could be reversed. Okay, so you've got a problem there with correlation and causation. You've also got a problem of biological determinism. So determinism is this idea that everything is predetermined, that we don't have free will, that kind of nothing can really change what's going to happen because it's all predetermined by your biology. Okay, but the problem with that is that if we assume that all of our behaviors are the result of evolution because they maximize our chances of survival, just for example, then not only does it imply that we have no control over our behavior, it also is a problem for people who don't follow expected behaviors or don't follow typical behaviors, let's say. So anybody who acts slightly abnormally or goes against what is expected, then all of a sudden doesn't fit into that mold of biological psychology. So for example, like I was saying before about partner preference, if a man turns around and says, well, actually, no, I'm not really that bothered about youth and chastity and fertility. I want somebody who is perhaps the exact opposite of that or whatever equally for a woman as well if they say i'm not bothered about resources and ambitiousness and all of that then all of a sudden that kind of behavior can't be explained by the biological approach okay so there is a bit of a problem there with saying that everything is down to bio to biology because it can't really explain everything so have a little bit of a read through that when you're ready for it and then finally you have um, a strength with some real world applications. The fact that the biological approach has been heavily involved in the development of things like antipsychotic drugs and antidepressants because of their research into the impact of serotonin and dopamine on behaviors. So because they've been able to kind of research those things and have a look at those things, it's then led to the development of drugs that have been hugely influential in actually helping people who suffer from things like depression and schizophrenia uh, get better. Okay, so it's been very helpful for developing treatments, which means it has a very, very good real world application as well. So you've got three evaluation points there. Obviously, you can feel free to use different ones or to add a fourth to that if you want. If you're, you know, if you're pushing for those really, really high marks in the essays, 16 out of 16, 15 out of 16, that kind of thing, then you might want to consider getting a fourth one. But those are three evaluation points that will see you get some pretty decent marks um, on any kind of essay that you would write on this particular topic. Okay, I hope that's all made sense. Um, and thank you very much for listening.